Do we know the location of Noah's Ark? The drilling down like a well, and, and, and this is what you'd get. But when they did their core drilling um, at these locations, uh, Sally said they had the wrong uh, type of drill. Right now, we're finding evidence for Noah's Ark. Recently, Answers in Genesis Canada made a video where they critiqued five different potential resting places. And we're going to take a look at that today to see, uh, do we know? Do we know for sure? We're going to hone in on one of those areas specifically, the Darupinar site in eastern Turkey, made famous by Ron Wyatt. And in order to talk about that, I've got my friend Andrew Jones with us live from eastern turkey andrew you want to say hello to everyone hey nice to be with you guys again yes. yeah thank you for having me welcome man nice welcome. hot day here good thank to you. see you thank again you. and uh i hear you say it's hot out there in eastern turkey yeah it's the summer months are here but it's good to be in this area where civilization restarted <laughs> yeah for sure yeah, literally literally where it all re-began um but uh, so, so you're at the, what's called the Darupinar site there. Um, do, you, do you want to kind of tell everyone just a little bit? I know some of the people uh, know who you are and they've seen you before. Of course, I went to uh, Mount Sinai with you, Jake and I did. But um, can, can you just kind of fill everybody in on, on where you are, what you're doing? You're not actually, you're, you're, the, the Noah's Ark that we're talking about isn't on Mount Ararat. It's adjacent to it. Uh, but you got a whole visitor yeah. center thing going on there. Tell everybody about it. Yeah, so we're, uh, I'm about uh, 30 minutes from this Darupanar site you've seen in this uh, photograph. Um, and so we, the Turkish government did build a visitor center there for tourists. Uh, we recently renovated it. And with the locals, we've been helping to run it. And um, we do uh, tours out here. Uh, we've been uh, teaming up with some of the scientists to do some more research, uh, which is exciting because we can get more data. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we do out here in the summer months before the winter snow hits, uh, the tours and the research. And, again, this site is not on the mountain. Um, it's just about 15 miles south of the Mount Ararat. Okay. Yeah, and give everybody just a little bit of a, a recap in terms of the history of this specific site. Like, who found it? Why was it? Why is it called the Darupinar site? Um, uh, maybe just explain yeah. a little bit about Ron Wyatt and his involvement in things, but just a little bit of a history. Well, yeah, briefly, this site was discovered September 11, uh, 1959, uh, by Captain Ilhan Durupanar. Now, he was a cartographer, a cartographer <laughs> a map maker for the uh, Turkish military, and he was looking at aerial photographs of this area of eastern Turkey making maps, and he discovered this on 9-11. Uh, <laughs> and then about a month later, it hit the news with the actual photographs. We'll, we'll show you some of those photographs. Um, and so in October 1959, and then 1960, a Turkish-American expedition came out here to check it out. Most of them came back saying, uh, it's probably a natural formation, but a couple of them were, were still interested. Uh, then you fast forward to the late 70s, and Ron Wyatt made his first trip out here, and he was an explorer, a biblical researcher from Tennessee. And then throughout the 80s and until the 90s, until he uh, passed away, he uh, was doing research and promoting this as the real Noah's Ark site. Um, and so uh, then from that time, we had other people involved, including Turkish scientists, which we were still working with some of them who started doing this work back in the uh, mid-1980s, uh, including Dr. Salih Barak Tutan. Um, and so I got involved myself in the late 1990s. I made my first trip out here in 1997 and then started uh, really doing uh, more research and tours around 2000. Um, uh, 17, 18, 19, and, and, and where I'm here today, 2023. Yeah, cool. So uh, so we have that little bit of history there. I think what I'm going to do is just kind of play the, the clip from the Answers in Genesis video. Now, it covers five okay. different locations, but I'm going to play that clip for everyone right now just so they can see it. They're aware uh, of, of what's out there. We love Answers in Genesis. They do a great job of, of believing in a for literal sure. flood. Uh, I, it, it seems like just kind of the uh, the overall official stance of the organization is that they don't know where they don't believe we know where Noah's Ark is, I guess, as, as an organization. Yeah. But we love Answers in Genesis. They do a lot of great stuff. The Ark Encounter is fantastic. It's it's well done. I, I mm -hmm. took my church there several years ago, uh, did a tour of it. So lots of great information. We feel like they're doing lots of good in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted to see your response to, to what they say here about this. And so 
Um, and so I'll just play this clip. It's only about a three minute clip of that video. I will post a link in the description to the video in its entirety. If you're interested, you can check that out later on, but here we go. The discovery of Noah's Ark would be an unparalleled archeological find. And throughout history, thousands of individuals have searched various mountains for the remains of this wooden structure described in the Bible and in numerous flood legends from cultures around the world. Ancient reports speak of the Ark as being readily accessible to certain groups of people, even describing an annual festival that supposedly took place on a mountain slope to commemorate the Ark's landing. Similarly to how some in the past have claimed to have actual pieces of wood from the cross of Christ, pieces of the Ark were allegedly taken and used as amulets. In the past century, dozens of individuals have claimed to have located the Ark, many who were professing Christians. Most of these modern searches have focused on Mount Ararat, which is traditionally thought to be the landing place of the Ark, located in eastern Turkey near the borders of Armenia and Iran. While some of these explorers claim to have found the Ark or its remains, others are a little more cautious. They call attention to an assortment of evidence that seems to support their beliefs, such as pieces of wood found high on the mountains or aerial and satellite images that show an Ark-like structure. Despite so many supposed sightings and evidences cited from Mount Ararat, it seems unlikely that Noah's Ark has been found in recent times. And even though most Christians would be ecstatic if the Ark were discovered, there's good reason to doubt that it ever will be found in the future. Nor would it likely convince many skeptics who could simply claim it as a replica monument to a mythical boat or make up some other excuse to disbelieve. However, a serious consideration for Bible-believing Christians to reflect upon is that promoting supposed evidence for the truthfulness of Scripture based on faulty reports could cause stumbling blocks for others, either for believers wondering if they can trust the plain reading of Scripture or perhaps unbelievers examining the Bible's truth claims. So it's incumbent on us to be honest with the evidence we're presented with and reject it if it doesn't hold up to scrutiny, regardless of whether it appears to support the Bible's history superficially. Certainly, as we've previously discussed, it's hard to imagine a large wooden structure surviving exposure to the elements for more than 4,000 years, and we'd expect much of the wood would have most likely been scavenged by Noah's family right after the flood to erect shelters and to build fires, etc. Also, if Mount Ararat truly were the landing place, how could the Ark have survived the volcano's numerous eruptions, which continued until 1840? However, these factors haven't stopped the search for the Ark or the reported sightings of it. And this episode will focus on five of the most popular supposed locations claimed to be the Ark's final resting place. Four of the locations on or very near Mount Ararat, while the other site lies hundreds of miles from this famous peak. Site 1, the Daripinar Site. Popularized in the 1980s by Ron Wyatt and others, this Ark-shaped formation lies approximately 15 miles from the summit of Mount Ararat. Wyatt claimed to have found numerous artifacts in the vicinity to corroborate his claims. In the past few years, the Daripinar site has again risen to prominence after being promoted on several websites as the real Noah's Ark. But despite its <laughs> Ark-like appearance and popularity, Christian geologists and archaeologists who would love to find the Ark and have visited the location have soundly rejected the Daripinar site as nothing more than a geologic formation. In fact, not just one, but several similar looking formations can be found in the region, as a simple Google Maps search demonstrates. These formations are caused by mud flowing around eroded outcrops of basalt lava flows. Okay, so um, I had to laugh there because he said that several websites promote this as... <laughs> Noah's Ark. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking one of those, you know. He should have gave the URL. No. <laughs> yeah, one of those would probably be discovered, discovered media, you know. I mean, I mean, that probably would be what he's talking about. But um, uh, I don't know whether he's actually viewed your, you know, your website or not. I, I would think maybe he has. But, um, no. you know, but I, my general thoughts, Andrew, when, when I watch this video is he's incredibly dismissive. Um, and, and this is just like a, a subtle critique, even though I would agree with probably 90 plus percent of the things that they cover in these videos. Um, a lot of times I think as Christians, we can just be dismissive or we can present our evidence and be dismissive of, of other evidence and other, other things just quickly. Whereas there is a deeper argument, a better argument to be made than they're giving credit for. And that was kind of how I felt when I watched uh, this portion on the Drup in our site. Obviously, I think you feel the same way, and that's why I wanted to get your perspective on this, 
you've got a whole weatherman thing going on there in your studio. Uh, and, and so I want you to show us, like, why is this Noah's Ark or why is this potentially Noah's Ark? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, this is not a critique against them. I love their work. I've been to the Ark Encounter myself. Um, promoting creationism and the evidence for the global flood is is needed because everyone, most people in the world don't believe in it. Um, but in regards to uh, the discovery of Noah's Ark, I can understand where someone, someone would be skeptical. You know, that's a big discovery. Or if it has been discovered, why hasn't that made the news more? Um, so their critique of the different claims, uh, it's great, but I think they have wrong information because – now they themselves have never been out here doing research. I don't. I don't know of any other person from uh, Ark Encounter or from Answers in Genesis that actually has been out here with the Turkish scientists. Um, so they're quoting other people, including good creation scientists, uh, probably Dr. John Baumgartner, or Dr. Andrew Snelling. Um, uh, so uh, the information they're getting are from these other individuals. Uh, and some of these, I think, only Baumgartner has actually been out here doing research. And we'll talk about, you know. Uh, what he's done and then why he changed his mind or at least why uh, like he ch did change his mind but we'll talk about why we think that was wrong um, but p other people like Andrew Snelling he, he was just quoting Baumgartner or John Morris and some of these other people who have attacked the site um, and so uh, the first thing yeah this video you know it's like what is it 10 or 12 minutes long but uh, the whole Derupinar segment is less than a minute so they're very dismissive. They're just like, ah, okay, you can find it on Google. So let's actually look at some of the stuff they, they say. There's two big things they attack, um, or they say to prove it's natural. Uh, the one thing is is that they claim it's not unique. Because if you can show that this is unique, then you got to explain why. Well, what is it then? But if you can say it's found all over the place here, then, yeah, it's a natural object because there was not a fleet of Noah's Ark, right? There's only one. <laughs> So uh, they, uh, one of the, uh, the articles out there, you can find on the internet, it was published in the late, or the, I think the mid-1990s, uh, was by Dr. Andrew Snelling, and it was called the Ark Exposé. It was in a creation magazine in Australia. And so now Dr. Snelling is, uh, I believe he works for Answers in Genesis, or at least ICR, Institute of Creation Research, um, out of Texas. But at any rate, in his article, they had this black and white photograph of the lower part of little air rat and they don't see the big mountain beside it there's two peaks of this volcano and they they claim in this enhanced photograph that there's other arc shapes and so that's the whole thing that they, this is not unique that you, you find these arc shapes all over the side of the mountain and so it has to be natural uh but you know um, and that's what the arrows in someone, the, are pointing to is that what the arrows are pointing yeah, to that's what, yes yeah and this is um you know it's a it's a low resolution photo because it was published in the 1990s. You know, now we have Google Earth, and he mentioned that in the video of the the presenter there. He was saying that you can just go on Google Earth and find these all over the place, which is strange because you actually can't. Um, I, someone sent me a Google Earth file that we and had everything marked where they believed there were similar arc shapes, but when you put it in 3D, like on a flat map, you say, "Oh, maybe that is an arc shape." But when you put it in 3D, you realize that well, part of that shape was um, like the ridge or a cliff. And then, so when you actually look at it in a 3D um, uh, model, it's this is not a boat shape, or it's or it's this huge long um, uh, formation that's inside of a, a, a lava flow. Um, when they first when this first uh, when the site was first discovered, 1959, they were looking in detail at these high altitude photographs, and and here's the actual photo um, that was taken by the Turkish military back then. And Captain Drupadar, who was looking at this um, this area, making maps for the military, uh, he was one who spotted it. And it wasn't like he found a whole bunch of these all over. There's only one uh, shape that got his attention because it was very a unique. Shape. Yeah, it, it, oh, for sure. Uh, a couple people I've seen on the internet say, "Ah, oh, if you look at the 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 uh, mud flow that it is now, this whole area, and this is where the the boat is here, and this is the zoomed in view. But if you look at this whole flow, uh, earth flow or mud flow, uh, there's more of these shapes all over. There's not. Um, you could go on Google Earth now yourself, or you can come out here and walk the mud flow, look at you know, get up on these hills and look down on it. Um, there's only one boat formation out there." And um, if you zoom in on the old photographs, you can see why it got their attention. Um, in fact, uh, the 1960 trip, so one year after this was discovered, 
uh, American Christian group came out here, and they hooked up with Doctor uh, with Captain Drupanar and the Turkish military, and they actually went out and explored the site. Um, and a couple of the guys uh, came back saying, "Look, we were too dismissive because the official statement they made was, well, we we couldn't find petrified wood. It's probably a freak of nature." Um, but a couple of the guys, including Doctor Brandenberger, uh, he was a, a, um, a photogrammetry expert um, with Ohio State University back then. Um, he was one of the experts that helped discover and identify the uh, Soviet missiles in Cuba. So the Kennedy administration used him for that, for the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he knew how to look at you know, high-altitude photographs. Um, and he was saying, and he made an official statement that you cannot find this in nature. There's nothing natural about this. You know, I'm paraphrasing him. But um, uh, he was more positive than everyone else. Uh, and... And so those who look at it and say, well, you can find everyone else, where, everywhere else in the region, they need to show the photographs. Because when they did this mapping expedition across the whole eastern Turkey, they only found one boat formation. And here are some more um, early 60 photographs. So this is the 1959 uh, one that was in Life magazine and it was all in the news. But two years later, 1961... The Turkish military hired Ara Guler, who was a famous Turkish photographer. He said, go take pictures of this object. And so he rented, um, with well, the military paid for it, but they had a, a little plane. And they flew a low-altitude uh, survey mission over the site. And these are some of his photographs that um, were in the Turkish news mainly. It didn't really hit the Western press, but these photographs show this boat formation sitting there in this flow uh, around it, this uh, mud flow um, and it was unique. There, there's nothing. There's not another one nearby. There's not another shape that you can say, ah, it could be Noah's Ark. Um, and it always comes down to, look, we have a boat shape uh, that's exactly the size of a Noah's Ark, you know, 300 cubits long. Yeah, um, right. Anyway, well, that's the other thing is that it's, it is, yeah. my understanding is it's the exact dimensions of the Ark. Is that correct? So, I mean, that's just another coincidence or supposed to Yeah, you know, let's say it was 5,000 feet long. You have this huge, you know, shape. That's, uh, well, it doesn't match the arc. So, yeah, when you look at all the little pieces, put them together, that's why there are people who are still interested in it, and there are websites promoting this as Noah's Ark, including ours, uh, because we believe that more research needs to be done, but it's the best location and best candidate. Uh, yeah. All the other sites, uh, you know, you, the video talks about other claims on Mount Ararat, um, but you have other problems, like as they point out, you know, there's only one site where you can actually go down there and measure it and take samples and look at it and take pictures. Um, and that's the drop in our site. And so his first part of this video, they're, they're just saying, they're very dismissive, very uh, brief. They just say, oh, you can find these all over. They don't show a picture of other ones. They just say it. I, I like to see those other photos, you know, because this, this site here was the only one that was identified back in the 19, uh, 50, you know, 50s and 60s. And I uh, got everybody excited. Um, and so that was his, you know, the, this video, that was the first um, thing they use against it is try to say that it's not unique, that you can find these formations all over the place. Now, the next thing is a little more involved. Uh, and this is where they try to explain, well, uh, how do you get this shape? And so a lot of the critics will say that the reason you have this shape is because you have this mud flow. And so as the mud and debris and, you know, water is going around something, an obstruction or which would be like a rock, something that's in the middle of this mud flow, it would create this boat formation, you know, the streamlined shape, sometimes they call it an almond shape. Uh, you know, so here's a, a drone photo I took, looking straight down on it, and in the middle of it, there is a rock. And so they, they always point to this rock and say, ah, see, this is what the, the, the dirt and mud is going around it. Um, so as this is uphill, where these arrows are, the south side is uphill, and as this mud is flowing downhill, it's hitting this rock that's in yellow here, and it's uh, creating this um, the shape you're seeing. Um, now, it's true. If you were to put like a rock or something in the middle of like a, a stream of water or something, as that liquid or like mud or water goes around it, it would create a streamlined shape. Now, the problem is if you look at what actually happens with fluid dynamics is that the pointed end is downhill. Yeah. And so as – liquid is going around this obstruction like a rock it's going to put the point of the downhill and where it builds up all the debris the rounded in is uphill so if there's a rock here as the water or mud is going around this is the shape you find in nature uh based on you know gravity flowing uh pushing the flow of water i should say or, or mud or liquid 
Uh, and that's the complete opposite of what you find at the Drupinar site. Uh, this is actually, the pointed end is actually uphill. And I've highlighted it in red with a, a little triangle. And the rounded end is downhill. And this arrow shows the direction uh, based on the mountainside where the mud and debris flows down. And so this is the complete opposite. Uh, unless they, they want to have the mud going uphill, um, there's no way that you can get the shape from an obstruction, this rock. You can't say that this rock is what formed it. Um, and, and more about this rock, because you know, some of the scientists realizing that uh, you can't say that uh, a rock created this obstruction and then it just made the mud pile up and created a boat shape. Uh, so they say, well, the whole, the whole thing is a rock. And then over, um, you know, here I'm highlighting the rock you see. When you, if you come out here, you'll walk in the middle. You'll see this limestone rock, sedimentary rock in the middle. Um, but all around it is this, uh, this boat formation. And so one of the Turkish scientists even published a paper uh, in 2005, or, uh, he presented it, and I don't know what year he it was actually published in a peer-reviewed journal, but he claimed that it was a solid uh, rock, and this is one of his graphics in his paper. He said this was a rock, and then based on glaciers and over thousands or, I don't know, millions, but you know, over a long period of time, um, uh, the ice carved this shape. And then you had the uh, weathering effect. And so basically he ends up saying at the end you have this astonishing <laughs> shaped uh, boat, uh, but all natural. And, and he even claimed in his paper or he said well, it would be nice if we could do uh, geophysical surveys, you know, see what's below the ground. And that was 2005. But he totally ignored in that paper um, the 1980s efforts by Dr. John Baumgartner, Dr. Sali Barak Tutan, the Turkish partner, um, who's and, and Sali is still around. I, I saw him last week here. Um, he's doing his own independent research. He's a retired geologist, a professor of geology. Um, and then, of course, Ron Wyatt did scans. So before 2005, they did do geophysical surveys, and none of them, none of those scans showed a solid rock. Like this boat formation is not a solid rock. And then fast forward. 2014, 2019, 2021, we had modern geophysical surveys done that's peering below the surface because we can't excavate yet. And we're, we're looking to see what is there. And none of those surveys show a solid rock. So this guy's uh, theory that this is a solid boat-shaped rock there is you could throw it out the window, uh, toss it overboard, sink it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it, Andrew. I love it. Hey, friends, if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you want to see more things like this. And you can actually go to PastorAJ.com to see this video in its entirety and find out more from Andrew about why this is potentially the resting place of Noah's Ark. What are you waiting for? Do it right now. Okay, so that, that's pretty incredible, Andrew. Basically, like what you're saying is that the conclusions that some of the people are coming to about why this is here naturally don't hold up. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, uh, their ship um, doesn't float. <laughs> their theory <laughs> doesn't float. It's a sinking. Uh, what they're trying to say is that this either rock or this object that's all over the place here, they're saying, you know, you can't find it. It's unique. And it's not a solid rock mass. Um, and so we've been going through these different proposed ideas of, well, how did this the shape get there? Yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, we're saying the shape is Noah's Ark, the decayed buried remains. And they're trying to find other explanations for it. Uh, but so far, their explanations are not, uh, uh, you know, it's not what you see on the ground. and It's not what we're seeing with the scans. Now explain um, so that. Dr. Explain Sally. what we're looking at there, because I know that there were actually scans done of this location, and that was right. one of the reasons when I was watching the Answers in Genesis video why I felt like uh, it was just kind of glossed over. One of the compelling pieces of evidence uh, that I found was the scans that were done, and, and apparently there were structures, yeah. you know, seen and everything. I'm sure you'll cover some of that, but it, explain explain what we're looking at there. Well, so here's what's really interesting. This is a diagram from one of Dr. Uh, Sali Barak Tutan, the, the retired Turkish professor of geology, one of his papers that he presented. Um, and this was uh, done independently outside of our scans, just from a, geologi uh, from a geologist uh, point uh, view. He was explaining from his own research how this valley, this, this yellow here you see, is this valley that has this mud flow in it, this earth flow. And at the top of it, on the surface, is this boat formation. And so here is this boat. And so in his diagram, uh, this rock 
this calcist rock, which is a, a limestone rock, is uh, what you see above in the middle. And he was showing that, look, this rock is not part of basement rock. It's not part of the surrounding area. Uh, it's actually floating. It, like, fell into the boat before it came down the hillside or rolled into it when it was already there. Um, because some of the criticism that you, you you know from these ge- other geologists, they'll say, again, this rock is part of the mountainside. The mud flow is flowing around the rock and forms the boat shape. As we just showed that, that's impossible. Number one, you have the opposite. You have the pointed end uphill. And so then they say, well, then the whole thing is a big rock that came down. And over time, the glaciers, and he was laughing at it. He said, there's no glaciers here at this elevation. But <laughs> this is that 6,500-foot elevation. Um, but they were saying, you know, that one article that had the diagram, that uh, like this diagram here we were talking about, that it was a solid rock that was just streamlined by glaciers and ice and weathering. Um, but from his own research, he was saying, like, this rock is in the middle and it is not part of anything else and it's not forming the whole object. And that's actually what we found in our own scans that, um, you know, that he uh, was not a part of, but it matched exactly his own research, which is like independent research matching our scans showing that this rock is uh, separate uh, and it's not part of the uh, hillside. Um, and so if you actually look, here's one of our scans, for example. We were talking about that. This was the 2019 uh, scans done for the Science Channel. Um, they did a film out here. And the American team, um, independent team, they're just here to gather the data. They actually scanned the whole site with GPR. Uh, they made a 3D model with LIDAR, with lasers uh, for the above surface. But below the uh, surface, their GPR showed right angles, uh, uh, p- parallel lines, um, and we had an independent uh, American archaeologist who teaches GPR to archaeologists um, from Georgia. Uh, he reviewed it, and he was saying that uh, the angular structure, the parallel lines that you see in the GPR data, would, for him, uh, uh, be a place that he'd want to dig to do an excavation. Because he said, usually in nature, you don't see stuff like that. Um, and so, again, this GPR is disproving that this is a solid mass of rock. It's not just one block of rock that came down the mountainside. There's actually layers, and there's dirt in between and mud filling up everything else, um, and you're seeing these lines there. Now, I don't have a slide um, about like, like the reasons like why we think it's Noah's Ark. And I mean, we're, we're basically talking about today is why we think the criticism is wrong. And so this is the one slide I have with the scans. But the scans do show that it's not a solid block of rock. No, and no, so I, that... I, I do remember there being, if I remember correctly, uh, Ron Wyatt had actually laid out, I don't know if it was like tape or uh, some ribbon where it was marking, it looked like a grid work of... Uh, yeah, he was the, using metal detectors, yep. And, and so I, th- and, I um, thought that was kind of yeah. kind of fascinating, that there was literally a grid work uh, using metal detectors, he found a, a grid work that, that went... It, Right. Sure. Yeah, no, that's true. In the 85, uh, 86, 87, um, they were doing metal detector. I mean, because, again, you're not allowed – the Turks have not allowed anyone to excavate the site or to dig a hole and destroy it. So you, you use a different technique to see what's below the surface. And so one of them was a metal detector. Um, and they found a pattern of metal that was um, – again, I don't have a slide for that. But that was only found in the, inside the boat shape. Outside was just natural rubble and randomness. Inside the boat formation, they got this pattern of metal. And this is the exact same thing you're finding with the other type of techniques, like GPR, which ground penetrating radar, with ERT, which uses the electricity current to, to map out the resistive nature of what's below the surface. What they're finding is that there's something unique. What we see above ground is the outline of a ship. Below ground, there's something unique that doesn't match the uh, outside area, outside the boat shape. Outside of it, it's just random rubble, boulders and dirt and mud. But inside... You get these patterns. You got the angular structures. You're getting these layers, um, and so these other scientists who are saying, "Ah, oh, it's just a freak of nature," um, and then they're trying to come up with reasons to explain, you know, well, what formed it. Uh, it doesn't match what you've seen on the ground and what you're seeing with the scans. An example of some of the uh, theories they've used to try to say the site is natural is, um, as a geologist, there's this, there's this thing called a syncline, which is how the rocks are folded, and it can create what looks like boat shapes. Large ones, small ones. Um, and so they try to say that this site here, and here's a diagram from actually a peer-reviewed journal that was published in the 90s. 
and they try to explain the boat formation as a geosyncline or a plunging syncline. Um, and you can Google a syncline if you want to understand more. Like I'm not a geologist, but you, it will explain to you and show you diagrams. So this guy uh, from uh, he was from he's a professor of geology in somewhere in Southern California. But he published an article basically saying, well, this is a syncline, and this is how you get the uh, the boat sitting there. I presented this to Dr. Saleh Barak Tutan, who's been the guy researching the site the most on the ground. He lives about four hours away. And so since in 1985 until now, he's been researching this region. And he started laughing. He says, I don't know where this guy got his degree. I mean, I don't want to attack someone. But he was basically saying that uh, you don't find this shape here like this because um, – if you look at the whole region, now this is a high altitude drone photograph above the site. So the arc is it's off the screen down here. We're looking towards the Iranian border. Um, this is the mud flow that's coming down where the arc sits in. But and then I'm just taking a photograph now to the left, and the air rats that way. But if you you can drive and you actually see this on the ground as you drive. But he said when you look, you see all of these layers. The layers are coming in from the Iranian border this way. So all this like limestone, rock, different types of rocks and dirt laid out, but it's coming in from the opposite direction versus what this guy is claiming in his diagram. Uh, he's having it going like from, from where we're at, like east to west, but the layers coming in is actually north to south. Um, and so it would not form a shape like this. You would not get a, a syncline uh, with a fold of rocks based on how the, the rocks are laid out on site. And so only someone who's studied the site and been here all these years knows that. But you have these uh, geologists um, who are writing articles and, and trying to come up with different reasons. And so that was one reason they said, is that, oh, well, this is formed by a syncline. You know, the folded rocks got eroded, it left a boat shape. Um, and that's not what you see on the ground, the way the rocks are laid out. And, the layers. and so what would uh, your response be to why the arc is – resting there because it i mean i am correct in saying yeah. that there is a mud flow around the ark right and yeah um, did the mud flow let, transport the ark there because I, I i heard that somewhere along the line too why why is the ark resting in that spot yeah so uh, this is the one where we talked about the flow of the uh of the mud around it i actually have another one that's zoomed out further but i don't have it in my slide deck but um you see the, the boat shapes right here yeah um and um, actually, if you zoomed out more, the black and white one, actually, that would be a good one to use. I might have to point out the shape. But you can see the boat shape there, I believe, on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you see more of the the flow. So this is uphill. This is the south end, and it's uphill. Uh, the top ridge is like 1,000 feet higher. So the, the flow is coming down. Uh, there are two hills. Now, the visitor center is right here now. This was the 1959 photo, so before they built this visitor center. And this is the village of Uzengeli. And so the mud flow is coming through this narrow channel um, between the two hills. And, if, and if, you if you take out this mud flow, you have this steep, narrow valley that goes another two, 300 feet below the surface today. That's all filled in now with mud and debris. Um, the reason why the boat is here. Now, Ron thought it was because of that rock. He thought, well, this rock is connected to the mountain, the rock that's in the middle of the boat. And so the, as the ship came down, it would have snagged and got caught and just stayed there instead of flowing all the way down to the base of the mountain. Um, because now we know with ERT that that's a boulder that's just sitting there. It's not part of the mountain flow, or the mountainside or nothing. It's not part of the basement rock. Uh, remember that diagram we had from Solly that had the yellow lines um, and had the rock in the middle? Yes. Uh, and the scans are matching that. Independently of Solly's research, are, the ERT scans are showing that this rock that's sitting in the middle – is just uh, floating along with the boat. It's like they rolled in there. Uh, so then why is the ark here and not all the way down at the bottom, lost forever? Well, Salah explained it as, he said, most of the mud is coming this way. And as it comes to this narrow channel, it's pushing the boat. That's why the boat is on this western side. It's pushed the boat this way. In fact, when you walk out there, you'll see that the boat is actually tilted towards the visitor center, towards the west, because this eastern mud flow is pushing it that way. He said he basically is being held there by, by you can call it friction or whatever, but this mud flow is pushing, the pressure pushed it up against the side and kept it there. Um, and and that, that's great because otherwise, you know, over time it would have continued down and then been lost and buried in the valley below. Um, and so now we have the boat stuck here kind of in this narrow channel, and, a, and it's a great location now for people to go up there, researchers or tourists, to see it. Uh, but, you know, that's – so if you look at the biblical account, we know that 
there was a global flood. And so obviously all the land was covered by water. And so when the flood ended and as the water was receding, going down, uh, the boat obviously would have hit the t uh, tire up on a mountainside. Because th there's, again, another 1,000 feet above here, this mountain. It's a low mountain, like 7,500, 8,000 foot elevation at the top ridge. And so the boat would have landed higher up. And so why do we have it at the 6,500 foot elevation now? Is because it came down with this uh, earth flow or this okay, mudslide. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so that, and then the snag here by the pressure, just keeping it there. Um, and so, and again, this is all, uh, you know, the critics will say, well, we kind of went over this, that this is a rock that came down from above, a ship-shaped rock that came. Uh, one guy published an article, the one that had the rock formation. He said, well, it was a rock up here, solid rock of limestone, came down and got stuck here. And then over time, you know, glaciers made it to look like a ship. But again, the scans are not showing a solid rock. It's, they're showing that there are angular structures. There are layers. It's full of mud and dirt. So you have to come up with another reason why you have this ship shape that's 300 cubits long. Right, in the right, mountains yeah. Of One more thing that they will say, and, and if you do uh, uh, research online about this site, uh, they'll try to quote from Dr. John Bob Gardner. So he was the one who at first was working with uh, you know, Ron Wyatt and David Fazold. Uh, and then he teamed up with Dr. Sali Barak Tutun, um, the geologist I've been, been mentioning who believes it is Noah's Ark. He's a Turkish geologist, professor, retired professor. And they actually did some core drilling. Um, and so they did radar. And the radar, they published a report. And the radar basically said, hey, we're seeing these layers underground. We don't know what they are, but it doesn't, uh, you know, you see basically it doesn't just prove that it's Noah's Ark. It's not like random layers. You're actually seeing some solid layers there. And so they wanted to core drill. This was 87, they did the radar. So then 1988, they came back and actually core drilled four holes into the, um, a second, into the uh, boat. And here are the locations. I had communicated with John Baumgartner via email, asked him to map out where they actually did these cores. Um, and he sent me the locations, which I've overlaid on my drone photo. Uh, and he explained each, like, I said, well, what did you find in each one? So, and he was telling me, well, he said, I didn't take any pictures of the cores. He said, I'm trying to remember everything we did, but he said, uh, core uh, one, this area here, he said, we drilled down about 10 meters, I believe it was, um, uh, you know, 30 plus feet, and we just got dirt, you say. It was nothing, so like, uh, didn't hit anything. Uh, number four is right beside that rock, and he said, we, we were basically drilling for a couple meters into the rock, and he said, we basically gave up because we realized, well, this is this is big boulder, so why keep drilling into the boulder? Uh Holes two and three, um, this is where it gets interesting because he has a different opinion than Dr. Sali Barak Tutan, who was his Turkish partner and the geologist. Uh, Baumgartner is a geophysicist, uh, and Sali, being the geologist, was the official in charge on the Turkish side. And so according to Baumgartner, on holes two and three, they drilled down about um, five meters. And at, at about five meters down or 15 feet down, he said they hit... Uh, this same rock. He was saying, oh, so this whole thing is a solid rock, he was saying right here. Um, I talked to, um, and then they gave up. He said, well, that was it. So I talked to Sally about this. This is actually a couple weeks ago. He was at the ARC site, and I said, hey, I, uh, you know, Baumgartner is saying that you guys drilled here and you hit the same rock, and so that the whole boat is a rock. He said, no, that's not the case. Um, if you look, look at this next slide, this is all just do when they core drill. It, it brings up like a three or two inch a sample, a column of all the layers you're seeing in the rock. It's you know it's a hole. They're drilling down like a well, and and, and this is what you'd get. But when they did their core drilling um, at these locations, uh, Sally said they had the wrong uh, type of drill. It was a water cooling drill that cooled a bit. That was drilling the hole it, using water to go down there, and the water was destroying the cores. So when the cores came up, you got nothing. It was like washed all the dirt away. He said <laughs> at the bottom. So as Sally was saying, at the bottom of the holes two and three, when they pulled up the bit, there was no nice layers showing what they were finding. All of them actually were not like that. There's no nice layers. But he says, at the bottom of these, all we got was a bunch of um, uh, broken up rock. He said, which doesn't prove anything because you can't get any. He said, we got zero useful data out of that, this whole core drilling mission that they did in 1988. Wow. And so... This is the and I was blown away because you know I have people quote Dr. Baumgartner and, and in fact it's interesting that in his newsletter right after they did this core drilling this is a quote 
he was very positive. You know, a couple months later, he put out a newsletter to his uh, supporters. Um, in, in 1988, he said, core drilling is severely limited in its ability to find buried archaeological structure. It's true, but it, it is used still. But it's mainly a geolo- geology tool because, you know, you have this three-inch hole. You can see all the layers. But you could be, let's say you drill and you try to find, like, a buried object. You could be one inch away from the object. You never find it because this three-inch hole went right beside it. So that's why it's fairly limited. But he said, um, uh, it's like right here, especially if it's sparsely distributed. You know, so if you think of Noah's Ark 5,000 years on the ground, uh, you know, you have uh, what's left of it. You're going to have maybe a structure. Maybe you have the solid beams left. So you might have something 10 feet away, and then over here another 10 foot, you have a solid beam. But everything else is gone. Um, so he's, he's basically saying that core drilling you can't really use to find stuff. Um, and, uh, and so anyways, this, he was kind of um, basically saying that our core drilling attempt uh, was not that useful. But now fast forward to today, and he's quoting from his core drilling attempt saying, oh, no, we, we proved that it's a natural object. We're finding – we found the solid rock. And Sali said, no, we got zero useful data because of the type of drill that they hired. It was a Turkish company. They got the wrong drill in there, he said. Um, and so, yeah, that, so we, you hear people talk about core drilling. And uh, we always, um, even today, we tell the Turks and whoever else is trying to do the research, uh, let's just do core drilling because they really do need a way to drill into there and discover what's below the ground without destroying the boat shape, which is very fragile. Um, and I just have a couple more slides I want to show. There's two more here. Uh, this was a ship. It's called the Sutton Hoo, and it was a Viking burial ship found on land in uh, the, the UK. Um, and all that was left was the shape of it and the rivets. Uh, everything else had decayed. It was a wooden boat. Um, and so it was a very fragile um, you know, object that they uncovered when they excavated it. And now if you look at the different photographs of the Drupanar site here on the right side, and you look at different sonar from underwater to above water, uh, other t- ships that have been discovered over time using archaeological tools from sonar to GPR, you know, radar. Um, you can see that these ships are wow. very fragile. These actual archaeological ships. Now, these are actual archaeological sites. And then this is the Drupanar site. Um, and, and, and correct me if I'm yeah, wrong, they, they look very similar, right? I mean, don't, yeah, exactly. don't they look similar? Yeah, they do. And, and that's the whole point is that those who have in their mind, like, you know, maybe 100 years ago, that they're going to find this perfectly preserved barge or ship up on high up on Ararat or wherever they want to look. They say, oh, it's preserved or broken in two pieces. Um, but anyways, that's been the, the claim of all these eyewitnesses that it's a preserved ship. In reality, you know, if you have a decayed wooden boat over thousands of years, it's going to look like this, which is what you see today above ground at the Drupadar site. And so you have this fragile object that's still the same shape and size of the boat, according to the Bible. It's in the mountains of Ararat. And the, the uh, geophysical scans are showing that there are layers and angular structures and parallel lines and patterns of metal uh, inside this object that we, uh, we can't just dismiss it as uh, a freak of nature. We think it is the buried, decayed remains of Noah's Ark. That's just incredible, Andrew. And uh, thanks so much, man, for showing us all this stuff. I mean, that was really, really informative. And, you know, obviously this isn't the kind of thing where it's like a salvation issue yeah. for Christians and you have to believe this is Noah's Ark to, uh, to know the Lord Jesus or something like that. It's, it's, there's, there's a difference of opinion on so many different topics within Christianity that, uh, you know, we obviously can't treat every single issue like that. Um, but, I felt like there was a case to be made here, and and to be honest with you, I just felt like there was a lot of interesting things that were sort of glossed over in the, I, I don't know how long they actually spent on the droop in our site in the Answers in Genesis video, like might have been 30 seconds maybe. Yeah, Something it was like very that. short. Yeah. So yeah, I just felt like there was enough there that we should give it a second look. Andrew, do you have any like uh, uh, kind of takeaway from all of this, from what we've talked about here, that you'd want people to walk away with? Well, if you look at where we're at in the the, the world's history, you know, we see that uh, we believe we're in the end times. Um, and as it says in uh, the Gospels, that as it was in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, and. Right now, we're finding evidence for not just Noah's Ark or Sinai and Arabia, but we're finding evidence for other biblical events, like from archaeology in Israel and Egypt and the rest of the Middle East. And now, why do we have this information? By faith, I believe that Noah had an ark, eight people were saved, there was a global flood. But there are people out there who do need physical evidence, like Doubting Thomas. They want to see the 
physical proof that these events happened. And God not wanting anyone to perish is willing to give them that extra evidence. And so I don't think we should be dismissive of anything that could help people uh, find the truth and prove that the Bible is correct. Yeah, well, cool. Again, thanks, Andrew, for coming on. Really appreciate it. You do tours of this site and others. So uh, do you want to yeah. tell everybody a little bit about that and how they can connect with you and maybe go on one of your tours? Sure. Since we're out here, we love to show people around. Whether you show up on your own, we'll just meet up and take you out to the site, or you go on one of our official tours. Uh, so we also not just tour eastern Turkey, which is the mountains of Ararat mentioned in Genesis. We also tour southern Turkey, where you have Haran, Jacob's Well, uh, where you have the proposed uh, birthplace of Abraham, the northern uh, location in Urfa. So we have a, like a patriarch's tour. Uh, they even have sites down there associated with Job. For those who believe Job lived in uh, the northern Mesopotamia, which is southern Turkey area. And so, yeah, there's a lot to see in uh, Turkey. You have a, the seven churches in the west to Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat in the east. And we'd love to have people come out here. They can go to our website. The main website for the whole project is noahsarkscans.com. And on the menu, there's a tour link. You click that, and it'll take you to the tour website. Uh, but if you want to send us a message, you're, you're already in Turkey, just come on out here. We can meet up for uh, tea and show you the sights. Awesome, man. Tea and crumpets like you're in Britain, huh? Yeah, tea and baklava. They have chai and Tea baklava. and baklava. Okay, okay. It's the Turkish <laughs> version. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, hey, folks, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll, we will see you next time. God bless you all. I've already told you about my recent trip to the Middle East and the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, but what you may not know is that you can experience these things for yourself. And it's all made possible through our friends and ministry partners at DiscoverSinai.com, where Andrew Jones and his team will take you on an adventure of biblical proportions to places like Noah's Ark, the Pyramids of Egypt, the real Mount Sinai and Red Sea Crossing site, the Split Rock of Horeb, Elijah's Cave, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jerusalem. I can't emphasize enough just how incredible this opportunity is. It will be life-changing for you and your family. And here's the cool part. You can do the whole tour or just book the individual things you'd like to see. And the prices are amazingly reasonable for this all-inclusive spiritual experience. Book your tour today at DiscoveredSinai.com. Hey, there's one more thing I've got to share with you. I want you to know that you know Jesus and that you will one day be resurrected and spend an eternity with him. The Bible says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That all you need to do is confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So just say this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised to life three days later. Make me born again in my heart through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved. Now go get yourself a Bible so that you can begin to develop godly habits in your life and make sure to join a Bible-believing local church where you can be baptized as an outward symbol of what God just did in your heart. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, send us a message and we'll get one to you. Welcome to the family, friend. Thank <laughs> you.